Welcome to Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck. Join host Hugh Duffy as he takes you behind the scenes with successful accountants, CPAs, and industry elites in conversations about growing a more profitable business. This podcast has been to prove that accountant marketing truly does not suck and, in fact, can provide you with new skills to improve your effectiveness so you can learn how to develop a business that you want to run, not a business that's running you. Hello, and welcome to the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Build Your Firm, an accounting marketing firm that helps accountants work smarter, not harder. I'm your host, Hugh Duffy, co-founder of Build Your Firm, and on today's show, we'll be talking to Tracy Segarra, Director of Marketing for Margolin Weiner Evans LLP. MWE is a top 100 CPA firm with offices in New York City and Long Island. I would like to share with you some insights on Tracy before launching into the podcast. Tracy is a grad from Binghamton University uh, with a degree in English literature. It used to be called back in the day SUNY Binghamton. Actually, I grew up in the area. Uh, after graduating from Binghamton, Tracy followed a classic journalism path, working for Children's Television Network, better known uh, as the producers of Sesame Street. Columbia Journalism, she was a reporter for several Brooklyn newspapers. She was a reporter for UPI and an editor for Accounting Today for seven years. After 20 years of journalism, Tracy became director of marketing for for Citrin Cooperman in New York City, which is also a top 100 firm. She was there for five years. For the past 10 years, Tracy has been director of marketing for MWE. On the side, Tracy has developed an expertise as a storyteller, both as a national speaker, a workshop leader, and enjoys doing it in front of live audiences. She has appeared on the Moth Radio Hour on NPR, the Story Collider and Risk live show and podcast. She's a three-time New York City Moth Story Slam winner. She's also a Moth Grand Slam champion and host of a storytelling show based on Long Island, Now You're Talking. With that not-so-brief introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce Tracy Segarra. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this and looking forward to learning more about your background. Before we launch into your career in storytelling, tell us a little bit about your role at MWE and your firm's approach to marketing. Yeah, sure. Uh, MWE is a full-service firm. We've been around since the 1940s. Um, we have just had our third managing partner for the past year. Um, we have about 180 people here, about, and uh, we have specialties in real estate and in manufacturing distribution, estate planning, and pretty much everything that an accounting firm could do. Um the uh my approach to marketing um over here i've been here for 10 years now and you know in the beginning there was a lot of direct mail and you know social media didn't exist so we've kind of evolved with the times and really what we focus on these days is content marketing so instead of having somebody you know out there making phone calls trying to get new business we are thought leaders and writing articles that are of deep interest to our prospects and our clients and we try to draw people to us so it's more inbound marketing than outbound marketing and we find that that's a it's been a really good way to uh, attract people to us you know we still do event marketing um and we do video marketing which is also becoming big we you know we're on social media and uh, we kind of keep track of where our clients are and follow them and, and just try to be there when they need us. That's great. I love inbound marketing myself. Tell us a little bit more about some of the content marketing stuff you're doing. Um, sure. We um, are constantly writing articles. Um, we are keep our finger on the pulse of what is going on. I always have my partners, you know, talking to their clients, what's keeping them awake at night? What are the issues that they see, you know, that it's not just one client. If, if it's happening at two or three clients, that's a trend. I'm a former reporter, so I know that that's newsworthy. That's interesting. It's going to be interested. It's going to be of interest to reporters and to other people in the industries and the, you know, the, uh, wherever these business leaders are, they're going to want to know. So, you know, we're in there on the ground floor talking to clients. So we may be noticing things before, you know, the news media gets a hold of it. And, um, we also work with the PR firm to make sure that, our partners are being quoted in the media, and we're we're getting our name out there that way. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> and what role does video play in your marketing? 
Um, it's really interesting because, you know, everything with social media, everything is kind of the great equalizer. It used to be if you wanted to get in front of a lot of eyeballs, you had to spend a whole lot of money for, you know, radio or TV ads or print ads. Now, if you have some compelling content and, you know, it goes viral, it doesn't even have to go viral. If you just get enough people to share it, you know, you can really have a great impact. So, Video is, you know, I mean, you've read the studies. I've read the studies that people love seeing video and they also like seeing, and you know, we'll talk about this when we get into my storytelling. They love seeing people being authentic and not just reading off cute cards or spouting what they think people want to hear. So we've started, you know, we kind of slowly dipped our, our toes in the water. So we have different partners speaking. Just we have a thing called Margolin Minute on our website where they just talk about one specific topic and we have our managing partner talking about recruiting and, and why, you know, it's, it's MWE is a good place for young people to work. And so we started off with that. So we have certain videos, but then what we did was um, we have, you know, a new class coming in every year, you know, of, of young CPAs. And so there's always, you know, before they come or when we're recruiting, we have everybody come in. And so our director of recruiting wanted to see if we could do a video, um, kind of letting them know what the first year in an accounting firm would be like. So to kind of give them a taste of what it would be like to work at MDB before they get here. And my marketing team, you know, with just a, you know, a, uh, an iPhone and a tripod. Um, we sat down a bunch of our people who had been through the first year and just asked them a bunch of different questions and using, you know, fo- uh, video editing software and putting some music behind it. We created these videos and we showed it to these first years and everybody at the firm was so blown away that they said, we have to share this with the world. So now we have it on our website. We have it on our LinkedIn. Um, and on our Instagram. So we're going to be doing more of those because again, it's, it's a lot more authentic. It's kids talking about, you know, I mean, kids, these are young people who are talking about, you know, um, what's the best place to eat around the office, you know, and, uh, what surprised them the most about their first busy season. And they're giving these honest, not canned answers. And I think people really respond to that. That's interesting. Um, Let's let's transition and talk a little bit about how MWE has evolved over time. I'm surprised that you've been around since the 40s and you're only into the third partner. Tell us a little bit about how the firm has evolved and changed over time. Um, well, we started out as a boutique real estate firm, and real estate was all we did. And, you know, one of our big clients was, um, you know, it, it just kind of, went kaput, you know, and so the partners realized that they really needed to diversify. And so the firm diversified and just started bringing in partners and people who had other expertise. And so we brought different industries and, you know, like I said, we're very big in the manufacturing and distribution industry, and we have some very deep, uh, industry expertise in, um, not industry, industry, but service expertise in tax and in estate planning. Um, so we just really developed that. We've only done two mergers in the firm's life. Um, and those were done a while ago, but that's kind of what the firm is like. We, we want to grow smartly, not rapidly and make sure that the cultures, the culture stays the same. It's a very, um, stable firm and we are well known, you know, on Long Island and in New York City. We're certainly really well known in the real estate industry because our roots, you know, go back 70 years for that. But um, the the firm is, uh, you know, we're one of the top 100 firms we have been for a very long time. And, you know, it's kind of slow and steady. Interesting. Okay. And. Let's talk a little bit about some of the marketing trends that you're gearing up to uh, for 2019. What are some of the things you're trying to transition or change in the year ahead? Um, I think what we're, we're going to try to do a lot more with video, like video on the spot. Just have, you know, as if we're a news organization, if something happens, we want to be there and just have a partner say, you know, like, let's say, you know, they just passed the, the biggest tax cut in, you know, in how, however many years, you know. What are the, 
what are what are your immediate takeaways about that? Obviously, nobody's had time to digest it, but that's the kind of thing that we're in a kind of an immediate world now. And if we can respond to that in a more immediate way, I think people will appreciate that. And I think it's something that we can do well because we do have that expertise and we do have uh, the knowledge that people are going to want when, when things happen. I mean, I know they just introduced, uh, in New York about reinstituting for, you know, to the deductions for salt for New York. So that's the kind of thing that we could easily respond to. So that's something we want to do more of. Um, we have found that content marketing, you know, that, that is a space that we are well, situated in and that we should do more of. I would love to see my partners more on radio and television talking about the issues that are related to, you know, being the financial advisors of mid-sized companies. I think that we should be doing that more. Um, and I think that, you know, our partners, we're, we're also doing a lot more to train our staff and to understand what it is that they, they have to be a much more holistic advisor and be much more aware of what's going on in the world to be competitive, you know, going into this, uh, this next decade. You had mentioned that you're using a PR firm. Are there particular verticals that you're focusing on or tell me a little bit about their role and what they're trying to get your firm uh, more exposure for? Um, well, you know, so our, our big areas are real estate, so they do focus a lot on that. Um, we have a great clientele of owner operators and, um, real estate management companies as clients, and we would always like more of those. I mean, every accounting firm has real estate clients, and there's certainly a lot of that going on in New York. We're one of the real estate capitals of the world. Mm -hmm. So we do focus on that a lot. Um, and also our manufacturing distribution. So they help us, you know, get our name out there. They're always looking to see what issues are going on that we can comment on. You know, they've got us into the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Cranes. The idea is to, you know, with, with, uh, you know, when somebody wants to choose an accounting firm, you know, it's not an easy decision. You get really married to whoever you're with. So when you're starting to think about maybe changing, the first thing you're going to do is to see, you know, who are, who are the thought leaders in these areas? And if you read an article and one of our clients is quoted, that may be the lead in to you learning more about our firm and eventually calling us and hiring us. Mm, that's great. So let's, let's make a little bit of a transition. Why don't we talk about something that's near and dear to your heart, which is storytelling. Can you I could talk about that. Can, yeah. Can you explain for our group what storytelling is? Since I'm sure. going to assume that most of them don't know what that is. Right. Well, it is not telling, you know, bedtime stories to children at libraries. That's not what it is. <laughs> Although that is a form of storytelling, but that's not what I do. Um, if your listeners have ever listened to the Moth Radio Hour or NPR, uh, This American Life on NPR, basically the storytelling I do is people telling true stories from their lives. And these are not anecdotes that you tell on a bar stool. These are stories that have an arc. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The person is one person at the beginning of the story. There's some inciting incident, some action, some crisis that happens. And from that, at the end of the story, they are somehow changed. They have some kind of aha moment. And they are a different person at the end of the story. And this is the arc of most storytelling. It's the arc of Toy Story, it's the arc of every, you know, uh, fairy tale you've ever seen. Um, but when you, t when you use it for your real life, it's, it's a very compelling and it's, um, become very popular. And I have a lot of theories about why it's become popular. If you'd like to hear them. <laughs> sure. I'll hear, I'll, I'll listen to a couple. Tell, tell us about it. <laughs> well, my theory is that, you know, how everybody's on their phone every second of the day and nobody talks to each other anymore. Mm hmm. When you're at a storytelling show and somebody is telling a true, compelling story from their life, you can hear a pin drop. You get their rapt attention. And I believe that we are so, our human beings are wired for story. We are wired to connect to each other and that all of this noise with technology just masks the fact that what we really are craving is human connection. And when somebody is telling a story that you can relate to, you not only relate to it, but there's science. You know, I've written an article about this. There, there's science that tells 
that they've done studies that when somebody is telling a true compelling story that shows vulnerability, that it activates this neurochemical in your brain called oxytocin, not to be confused with oxycodone. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a drug. Um, but it's basically the feel good chemical. It's the chemical in your body that the empathy gene that tells you that you can trust somebody. And once that's activated, you not only feel empathy for the person telling the story, you start feeling the feelings that they're feeling. You trust them. And then you are much more likely to take whatever action it is they ask you to take which is why storytelling is becoming so popular in nonprofits, in businesses, in industries, um, and, and just in general, because it creates such a strong connection between people. That's interesting. And are there parallels between this approach and journalism and storytelling or not? Well, I think so. I mean, I started out life as a journalist and, you know, the best journalists, they give you the who, what, where, when and why, but they also tell you a story. I mean, that's that's what some of, you know, the best journalism pieces you'll read start out with a story and then they get you, you know, all of the details. Um, so, yeah, I think my journalism training. Well, what's great about journalism is that what it taught me was to really probe for what what's really lying underneath like people can tell you the basics but you know you can ask more and more questions and one of the things that i learned as a young journalist is i would talk to one source and i'd say okay i got it i got the story the story that i told that ended up on the moth radio hour is about me and my future mother-in-law and our first bus ride together the first time we were ever alone together um to go look for wedding dresses and you know and i start the story with I'm an express bus to the Bronx with my future mother-in-law and I'm not happy about this because she and I are not exactly friends. I feel totally uncomfortable. So immediately you grab the audience by putting them in a scene. And that's what great storytelling can really do is put you in the scene. So you're there with the person and you know that they want something or something is happening and you make them want to know what happens next. We want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, BizPayo, which is short for Business Payments Online. Maybe you've seen some of their advertising elsewhere or the feature article in Accounting Today. Here's why accountants across the country are big fans of BizPayo. BizPayo is an online system for sending out engagement proposals and then getting paid on autopilot. If you hate chasing existing clients for payment, then BizPayo is a tool you need to have in your arsenal. Here are some of the amazing reasons why BizPayo is so popular. BizPayo's engagement tool enables you to send out proposals and client agreements. Once approved by your prospective client, it enables you to get paid electronically going forward with less effort so you don't need to chase clients for payment. BizPayo accepts recurring and one-shot payments online, both e-check, credit card, and debit card payments with less hassle. BizPayo enables you to get paid by credit card and debit card payments at $0 net costs. This is very different than PayPal, Intuit Merchant Services, and other payment systems that take a fee in excess of 3% of each payment to you. BizPayo enables you to recover those fees so you get paid for plastic charge card payments at $0 net cost. BizPayo also syncs with QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop, so all your payments are posted seamlessly. With BizPayo, there's no nickel and dime charges either. There's no equipment costs, no processing minimums, no PCI charges, and so on. So go to BizPayo.com, that's B-I-Z-P-A-Y-O.com, and get paid in full like you deserve. Interesting. So a lovely bus ride with your mother-in-law. And, mm -hmm. uh, and how, did that, how did that scene go? Well, it's a very uncomfortable ride down because she and I, what I say in the story is she and I come from very different worlds. I'm a middle class Jew from Long Island. She's a Sicilian from the Bronx and a Jehovah's Witness, this, you know, strange religion I know nothing about. And I'm marrying, I'm about to marry her son, who's a lapsed Jehovah's Witness. And I know that she has not been all too happy about that. And so she and I had not really been friends up until this point. But I'm marrying her son, so I decide, I'm like, okay, I should reach out to her somehow. So that's why we're going wedding dress shopping. But it's really uncomfortable at first because she and I have never been alone in a room together. <laughs> but once I start trying on the wedding dresses, 
she starts telling me I look beautiful in every in every dress, which is a lie, but it's sweet. And <laughs> it kind of it kind of just starts breaking down the wall between us. And you know, by the end of the story, she becomes like my second mother. Really, that's yeah. amazing. Okay, mm-hmm. and in many ways, storytelling is like stand up kind of comedy. Tell us a little bit about the parallels between stand up comedy and what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of people feel that way, and there are a lot of stand-up comics who do storytelling, but the big difference between stand-up and storytelling is that there can be a lot of laughs in storytelling, but it's not the point. I mean, in, in, in stand-up, as I understand it, because I'm not a stand-up comedian, but I know a lot of them, is you have to like make people laugh like every five, ten seconds. That's the idea. It's like, make them laugh, make them laugh, make them laugh. In storytelling, it's the laughs come out of the situations it's more situational comedy um you know one of the lines in my story about my mother-in-law that always gets a big laugh is that you know she's a sicilian from the bronx and you know one day i hear her talking to my three-year-old twins and she's like oh i love you so much i just want to punch you you know and it's just like that's her way of showing love and so it comes out of the story um, and it's a true thing that happens, you know? <laughs> um, but it's not like, yeah, let me, do you guys ever think about staplers? You know, I mean, it's not, stand-up comedy is very different. And the big difference also between storytelling and stand-up, even though some good stand-up does have vulnerability, is that storytelling at its best is letting you see a side of people that people don't normally show, letting you in on their foibles and their fears and their, you know, not being such a perfect human being. Hmm, interesting. And, you know, what inspired you to get in front of live audiences and do this on a competitive basis? Um, what inspired me is I started, my husband turned me on to the Moth Radio Hour and I started listening to it. And my first thought was, this is amazing. I can't believe this is an art form. And my second thought was, I have to do this because I've been writing, you know, personal essays all my life just for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had a blog for a little while and I was an actress when I was like in high school. I gave it up after high school because I just knew I wouldn't be able to deal with the rejection. Um, But now I was much older. My my kids were almost grown. (coughs) And, you know, I knew that they had these story slams, which are competitions in the city and I just said, okay, I, got, I I have to try this. It's like I was in my 50s. I'm like, I got to try this, you know. And so I went to my first story slam just to observe. So I saw kind of how it went. They basically, anybody can put their name in, in the hat and they pull out 10 names at random and it's on a theme and 10 people get up and tell a story. And then there's judges in the audience, just people they randomly pick and somebody wins. And so I watched it and I was like, wow, this is great. I definitely want to do this. I found a theme that kind of fit the story that I wanted to tell. And I went and I put my name in the hat. My name got called. I told the story and I won. And I was like, hmm, okay, this is the universe telling me something. And then I won more competitions and then I won a Grand Slam, which is 10 winners competing against each other. And then there's, I discovered this whole scene New York City storytelling scene where there are just shows and they're not competitions. People just get up and tell stories. And I developed this entire new society circle of friends, most of them who were like 20 and 30 years younger than me, just, you know, working on this art form. And I took a storytelling class to learn how to tell funnier stories and Then I started my own show on Long Island because I'm a marketer by day. And I looked at Long Island and there was one storytelling show, but it was way out in Port Jeff. And I said, I know that there are other people like me who would love to go to a storytelling show. So I started it in the basement of a bookshop in Rockville Center. The first show I had and I I brought five other storytellers and I had 50 people jammed down there. And since then, I've sold out the Bolton Center. I've sold out the Merrick Theater. I nearly sold out my father's place, which just reopened in Roslyn, um, you know, a few weeks ago. People love this as entertainment. People love going somewhere where they can think, they can laugh, they can feel. Um, and it's, it's been an incredible journey. And now people are hiring me to, you know, to teach storytelling to businesses. I'm, I'm going to be doing a six week storytelling workshop at a senior center in Rockville Center. Um, 
you know, I, it's, it's crazy. It's just like, I'm not even looking for it. And people are coming to me. Newsday has written um, a couple of stories about me. And so I'm just getting people contacting me through my website. And it's, it's obviously meant to be, I tell people that I honestly feel like this is what I was meant to do with my life. And, and all of the doors just keep opening. I, 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 there's so many doors opening that eventually I'm going to have to hire somebody to help me because it's just already getting too much. I'm starting January 1st. I'm working four days a week at my day job here so that I can devote one day to just to my storytelling business. That's a good problem to have. Now let's yeah. go back a little bit. So the first couple of times, did your kids go and watch you? Did they watch me tell the stories? Yes. Live, um, yeah. In front of other people. Yeah, the first show my daughter came and brought a friend, and it was a, it was a pretty it was a funny story about when I was young and uh, a little embarrassing for her. But they are very proud of me. And then the first time I I um I held a show in a big theater, a hundred eighty seat theater. Um, my kids were there to hand out programs and to take tickets, and they're incredibly proud of me. When I when I you know went and I competed in the Moth Grand Slam. One of my daughters is always there to sit with me in the VIP section in the front. And, uh, yeah, I think they're, you know, and they help me with my stories. Like last night, I'm, I'm going to be telling a story, um, on Thursday at, uh, PBS on, uh, WGBH and PBS. They have a stories from the stage show. So I'm going to be, they're going to be taping a show in front of an audience. And so I was trying out my story on my daughter last night and she gave me some notes, which was nice. That's interesting. So as you prepare for a storytelling event, is there a particular process that you follow? I know you had mentioned a little bit about the process, generically speaking, but as you're thinking about an event, is it for a specific audience? Tell, tell us about how you prepare for that. Well, sure. Well, usually there's a theme, you know, so if I'm telling a show, telling a story for another show, like the, the story I'm telling um, on on Thursday is about my wedding back in uh, 1997 and how my father almost didn't make it because he was in jail. <laughs> so, hmm. so the, you have to figure out what the story arc is like, who am I again? Who am I at the beginning of the story? I'm about to get married and what do I want? What is, you know, I'm the protagonist in the story. And that's the other important thing about storytelling is the story has to be about you in personal storytelling. You, you, I can't tell a story about my father's point of view. I can only tell it from my point of view. He would tell an entirely different story, I'm sure. <laughs> so you have to figure out the arc of the story. Who was I at the beginning? What are the inciting incidents? What happened? What's the climax? And how was I changed somehow by this story? What did I learn? Hmm. So that's what I do for each story. And, and are there particular methods that you take to get a room full of strangers to trust you? Um, it's all about vulnerability. It's all about letting them see the unvarnished me. It's not, it's being, because most people are afraid to let you know the thoughts that are going on inside their head. Um, and for some reason, I'm just not afraid. Hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with being older. I think I would have been afraid 30 years ago, but you know, once I hit my fifties, I was just like, you know what, this is who I am take me or leave me. And honestly, what I've found through telling stories is that people just are drawn to me because of that. And, and a lot of people come up to me after I tell stories and they hug me and they want to, you know, I've made a ton of new friends through storytelling just because they've heard me tell my stories and they're like, I feel like I know you. And they do because most people won't allow perfect strangers to see that much into you. And I, I'm not afraid to do it, and in fact, I, I welcome. And and, are, and I think I know the answer, but are there certain traits of a great storyteller? Um, the first great trait is you have to be able to look at yourself critically. You the, the the funny thing about storytelling is if somebody tells a story and they're the hero of their story, it's usually not a very good story. It's the stories where we talk about how we failed and how we said or did stupid things or how we totally misjudge people are the ones that people gravitate towards because, you know, we, we are all frail and, you know, we, we don't always do the right thing. And it's so hard for people to, you know, to let people see that side of them that when they see somebody else doing it, not only do they 
Are they drawn to you? But it makes them feel like, wow, maybe I can do that too. Maybe I can be more open with people. And it's, you know, when I teach story, I teach storytelling workshops. And a lot of the times people come out of this workshop and they're like, wow, that was like therapy. <laughs> you know. And I am a therapist in a way because people will, most of the time when people first start story storytelling, the mistake they make is they tell you what happened. This happened, this happened, this happened, then this happened. They think that's the story. That's not the story. The story is what was going on internally. What was going on inside of you? You know, what was going on inside of me when I, when I, my dad was in jail and I thought that he wasn't going to be at my wedding. Why did I really need him so much to be at my wedding? That's what people want to know about. Hmm. That's fascinating. So let's bring this a little bit closer to the corporate world. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about some of your corporate clients and the opportunity you've had in working with them. Sure. Well, just recently I worked at a, with a partner at a law firm and he's got this whole PowerPoint, um, about, you know, alternative funding for, you know, to, to raise money for, for entrepreneurs. And this PowerPoint is full of facts and figures and regulations and rules and, you know, articles and, you know, it didn't have any soul. <laughs> so I talked to him for like an hour. And I'm like, all right, so how did you get into this, this field, you know, and why do you like helping these entrepreneurs? And we, we really dug deep into, he's really passionate about using this kind of alternative funding. And he's been writing articles about it. He's testified before committees. Um, he's told everybody he knows that he thinks this is great. And then he finally found, um, a company that wanted to to do this and he helped set them up and that company has raised you know half a million dollars and they have this fascinating alternative energy uh, storage that they're working on and I'm like okay okay this is your story this is how instead of starting with all the history of alternative funding talk about your connection to it because that's what's going to grab people in the beginning and so I drafted up a whole story based on our conversation and he just loved it. He can't wait to do this because that if you open up a PowerPoint with, you know, like five bullet points, facts and figures, you're losing people right away. But if you open up with a story, then they make a connection with you and they understand your connection to what you're going to be talking about. And then you can go into the, you know, the details of what it is. Hmm. That's, that's fascinating. So if you could teach a person how to tell a story mm -hmm. as part of their presentation, how would they do this? Um, well, they have to either have a conversation with me or with themselves and understand, you know, where there is a personal story. What we want to know is what is your personal connection to whatever it is you're, you're telling me about? You know, did you have a client that had you know, some crazy story or some something that you solved for them or tell us about a time where something almost went wrong and, you know, you helped make it right or when you totally failed and you learned from that. So the next time you did things differently, because, again, you know, and a lot of people think in business you can't show vulnerability, but I think that's a big lie. I think that if you show people, yeah, you know what? I screwed up one time. I was a young, you know, accountant. Or I was a young attorney and I, I thought if I did things this way, this would go great. And I totally messed it up. And so what did I learn from that? That I need to do things this way. And if you tell that story up front and then you go into whatever it is you're teaching, you will already have them on your side because you've let them in to let them know you're not perfect. Yes, you're giving them information. You're teaching them something, but you're a fallible human being and you're, um, you're human. I mean, I think the thing, especially with accountants and with lawyers, you know, how do they get business? People want to do business with people they like, right? How do you get people to like you? It's not by telling them how smart you are. It's by making that human connection. So this is bringing stories into business is all about making human connection. Hmm. I've seen examples where people have done that. I just didn't realize that, you know, they took your class, <laughs> in which they didn't. But so can you think of well-known brands, because brands are easier for people to think about, uh, right. who've done an excellent job telling their story? Yeah, I mean, Steve Jobs was wonderful, um, you know, with Apple. Like, he, it wasn't, 
just to technology. He made it into, you know, it was transforming the world. And, you know, you remember all the old Apple commercials and Mm -hmm. how he first introduced the iPhone. I I forget what exactly it was, but there's a video of it where he's like, it's a phone. It's a music player. It's a computer. And everybody thought that it was three different devices he was showing. But then it turns out to be one. And, 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 and he talks about the human connection all the time. Another one I love is Richard Branson. Do you know the story of how Richard Branson founded Virgin Atlantic Airlines? Not really. I mean, uh, obviously I know him, but no, go ahead. So basically he was a young guy and he was supposed to be on a flight to go meet a beautiful woman on, I don't know, it was the Virgin Islands or somewhere. He was, he was going to go to meet them and his flight got canceled. And he really wanted to meet this woman. <laughs> he did not want to be delayed because his flight was canceled. So he looked around at all the other people who were on that flight and he chartered a plane and got all these other people to come on with him so he could go meet that girl. And that was the genesis for the idea for Virgin Airlines. That's interesting. Uh, and I, so, I give him credit for having that, that willpower. Right? right. And what a great story to tell once you have established a business. Because, again, you get that human connection. Here is a young guy who wants to meet a, to see a pretty girl, you know. And there, are there certain individuals out there that people would know that do this consistently and do a good job of framing who they are and connecting with the audience using a process like this? Um, all right, you're stumping me now. <laughs> you know, the, I, some of the best TED Talks, if you look at like the best TED Talks, there's one guy and I can't remember his name. Um, most CEOs, you know, who are out there in the public talking usually are able to tell a good story. Um, you know, Herb Kelleher from, uh, Southwest, he always would tell great stories. Um, the guy from Zappos, right? I forget his name. Um, you know, he would talk about his customers, you know, he would respond to his customers on Twitter. It's again, it's forging that human connection. Anytime you do that and you're not a faceless, nameless monolith, you, you get people to be on your side and you get them to want to be a part of what you're doing. You know, Tom shoes, you know, what a great story there. He started a shoe company because he wanted to provide shoes to people who didn't have them. Hmm. That's perfect. Tracy, I'd like to thank you for openly sharing your story, for taking the time to to educate people like myself, who uh, obviously have not been open enough, uh, not been able to look at myself critically enough. Uh, but uh, it's been great to learning more about your storytelling. It's fascinating. Um, to learn more about Tracy Cigar, I encourage you to visit her website, which is www tracycigara.com let me spell it for you t-r-a-c-e-y s-e-g-a-r-r-a dot com uh, just like her name tracycigara.com so I encourage you to go there to learn more I have watched some of her storytelling episodes out in Long Island they're fascinating they're interesting um, and hopefully you can learn more about what she does in closing I'd like to thank Liz Gould with Rhino Girl Media for encouraging us to produce this podcast And uh, hopefully have a wonderful day and you start to incorporate some of the things that Tracy has shared with you today. Goodbye.